the modern metallic centerfire cartridge. Dependable, resilient, and largely unchanged over the last 150 years, the modern centerfire cartridge is not a product of a single innovation, but rather a series of incremental improvements. The modern centerfire cartridge consists of four components, the bullet, the propellant, the primer, and the casing. The primer is situated in the center of the base of the cartridge, hence the name centerfire. The primer consists of a metal cup and a small amount of a shock-sensitive compound. As the firearm's firing pin hits the primer, it ignites, generating copious amounts of heat. This heat ignites the propellant. The most common form of propellant is nitrocellulose-based. Nitrocellulose is made by combining cellulose, the main component of plant cell walls, with nitric acid. As the propellant burns, it generates large volumes of gas, generating pressures in the tens of thousands of psi behind the bullet, propelling it down and out of the barrel. There are a lot of variations in bullet composition and design, but a common configuration is a thin copper jacket over a lead core with a pointed tip. The last part is the casing. Usually made of brass, they contain and protect the other components, but they also play an important role in the functioning of a firearm. As the propellant burns and the expanding gases push the bullet down the barrel, the brass casing expands slightly, creating a seal at the breech end of the barrel. This keeps the pressure within the barrel, allowing the bullet to gain kinetic energy. Once the bullet has left the barrel, the pressure drops rapidly, and as it does, the brass casing contracts a small amount, allowing for easier extraction. But guns have not always worked this way. The first firearms appeared in China in the 10th century, but we're going to jump into the timeline at the 17th century. Long before modern cartridges, we had black powder muskets. This particular musket is a French model 1777 artillery carbine, produced in Saint-Étienne during the French Revolutionary Wars at the end of the 18th century. As opposed to the ammunition being one complete package, every component is a separate item, and as such, a lot more cumbersome to handle. So how do you fire one? You start by filling the flash pan with a small amount of black powder. The flash pan has a small tube that connects it to the barrel of the musket. A charge of black powder is poured down the barrel, followed by a lead musket ball, usually accompanied by a cloth patch. Once the musket ball has been rammed down the length of the barrel, and you have cocked the hammer, the weapon is ready to fire. When the trigger is pulled, the hammer, which holds a sharp piece of flint, drops. As it drops, it pushes the flash pan cover aside, and as it does so, generates a shower of sparks, as the flint scrapes against the metal surface. The generated sparks ignite the black powder in the flash pan. This in turn ignites the powder charge in the barrel, which propels the musket ball out of the barrel. A well-trained soldier would have been able to fire this particular musket three times in a minute. But the slow reload speed was far from the only limitation of the system. Flintlocks were relatively reliable, unless your black powder got wet. Black powder was the predecessor to modern smokeless powder. Comprised of a mixture of sulfur, carbon, and potassium nitrate, black powder produced much higher amounts of waste products, meaning large amounts of smoke would be produced every time you fired one. This also meant that the guns were very quickly became fouled up, forcing you to clean out the solid residue buildup in order to continue using the weapon. Our specific musket here is a carbine variant, meaning it has a shorter barrel than standard. Even so, the barrel is still around 80 centimeters long. When you compare that to a modern rifle, the difference is obvious. The reason for the length comes down to the pressure created by black powder. Because it is a low pressure propellant, you need a long barrel to allow the expanding gases to accelerate the projectile up to the required velocity. The next major step up was the advent of the percussion cap fired firearm. These improved on the ignition method of black powder. Rather than using a flash pan containing black powder, these newer designs used percussion caps, small cylinders of brass or copper containing a shock-sensitive explosive, generally mercuric fulminate. These percussion caps are placed on a nipple that has a thin tube leading to the barrel. As the hammer impacts the percussion cap, it explodes, sending sparks down the tube, igniting the black powder in the barrel. This might not seem like a major advancement, but in practice, percussion caps were much more reliable, more resilient to adverse weather conditions, and faster to use. Percussion cap-fired guns still used black powder, and some were still muzzle loaders. However, as is the case with our 1853 Sharps carbine here, 
many began to incorporate a breech loading action. Rather than having to pour the black powder down the barrel and then push the projectile down after it, breech loaders allowed you to push a paper cartridge into the breech end of the barrel. These paper cartridges consisted of a lead projectile and black powder encased in a paper roll. You could then load this into the rifle, close the breech, which would in turn shear off the rear of the cartridge, exposing the black powder inside, position a percussion cap, and be ready to fire. Whilst this was a much better and faster system, black powder still had many limitations. Black powder, after combustion, is still well over half solid particulate, as opposed to gas. This meant that the barrel and any exposed mechanism would quickly become fouled with residue, meaning regular cleaning was required. All that particulate flying out of the barrel also generated a lot of smoke, which had the double disadvantage of revealing your position and obscuring your vision somewhat. Our specific rifle here has an interesting system for dispensing percussion caps. As opposed to manually putting a cap on the nipple for every shot, it has a spring-powered magazine of thin percussion discs. As you pull the trigger and the hammer drops, a disc is fired out of the magazine and is caught by the hammer as it falls, before being crushed between the nipple and the hammer. Whilst this was a lot more efficient, it was only about 80% reliable, so many users decided not to bother with it. Moving on, we'll now look at a self-contained, primer-fired, metallic cartridge, the pinfire system. Our example here is an 1851 Lufa Shaw Poing revolver, a very small pistol with a priority place on its ability to be concealed. The Lufa Shaw system has nearly all the components of the modern centerfire, just with an unusual firing method, and still using black powder. Our primer is contained within the cartridge, as is a firing pin. Being a self-contained cartridge, you load this into your firearm, and after the hammer is cocked, you are ready to fire. After you've pulled the trigger, the hammer drops, hitting the pin that extends from each cartridge. This impact pushes the firing pin into the primer, located on the opposite wall of the casing. The primer ignites, igniting the black powder, which propels the bullet down the barrel. No messing around with percussion caps, no pouring powder down a barrel, altogether a much easier type of ammunition to use. It offered other significant advantages as well. None of the components were exposed to the elements, all being safely encased in a metallic cartridge, and thus they were protected from adverse environmental conditions. Of course, the new system wasn't without its drawbacks. The protruding firing pin was its primary weakness. While the protruding pin was no issue in a revolver-style firearm, they would have been rather awkward to use in any kind of self-loading firearm, limiting the design's flexibility for future advancements. The exposed firing pin also came with a small chance of accidental discharge. If they were dropped, gained sufficient momentum, and landed on the firing pin, they could detonate. While pin fire came and went, another system found its niche, and is still in widespread use today. Rimfire cartridges are another form of self-contained metallic cartridge, just with a different method of ignition. Rimfire cartridges, as the name suggests, have a rim around the base of the casing, containing a priming material. A firing pin strikes the edge of the cartridge, crushing it against the perimeter of the breech. This ignites the priming material, which in turn ignites the propellant. When rimfire cartridges became popular in the mid to late 1800s, they initially used black powder. They later made the switch to smokeless powder as the latter became available. To allow for a firing pin to detonate a rimfire cartridge, the walls of the casing need to be relatively thin. This wasn't too much of an issue with the low pressure black powder, but the high pressure smokeless powder would rupture casings in larger sizes of ammunition. This has meant that modern rimfire cartridges are almost exclusively in small calibers, but are incredibly popular due to their affordability and low power, making them ideal for target shooting, training, and small game hunting. Towards the end of the 1800s, the centerfire cartridge emerged onto the scene. It did not establish dominance immediately, but over time, the thicker casing proved to be resilient, and the rimless cartridge was a perfect match for the evolution of repeating firearms. Without a need for a protruding rim or pin, the centerfire cartridge presented a smooth, symmetrical profile, so they were much easier to feed into a repeating mechanism, allowing for a reliable automatic firearm. While the early centerfire cartridges contained black powder, they really came into their own upon the invention of smokeless powder towards the end of the 1800s. Smokeless powder, with its much higher pressures, could be more easily contained in the centerfire's thicker casing. 
This increased pressure led to higher muzzle velocities, allowing for flatter shooting projectiles, better range, and increased armor penetration. There were other practical advantages as well. With more power coming from less propellant, cartridges could be smaller and lighter, enabling armed forces to carry more ammunition. It was also a much cleaner propellant. Whereas black powder's combustion products were primarily solid particulate, smokeless powder produces almost entirely gas, meaning firearms can fire many more rounds before residue buildup begins to affect their operation. So there we have it, the modern centerfire cartridge, the result of a multitude of developments and gradual improvements, rather than one great leap forward. Newer innovations have attempted to take its place, but none have gained much traction. So it would seem that the center fire is here to stay. A big thank you to Parade Antiques for allowing me to film the three Histoc firearms you've seen in today's video. Based in Plymouth, Parade Antiques is a treasure trove of rare, historic, and collectible items. From artwork and fine china to jewelry and memorabilia. You can find a link to their website in the description. If you liked the video, perhaps consider subscribing. 